So good morning, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Thank you for joining us. I think uh, everybody who's chosen to spend an hour and a half with us this morning is relatively familiar with the context of Myanmar, but I think it's worthwhile to take two or three minutes at the onset before we dive into particulars around COVID to remind ourselves just how unusual Myanmar is, and in particular, just how unusual Myanmar's triple transition, which has been underway since 2011, uh, makes the country relative to others in the region and around the world in terms of the response to COVID. Right? We'll all remember that um, this triple transition, which uh, began, began in 2011, accelerated possibly through the 2015 election, has moved Myanmar away from what was several decades of autocratic rule under a, a military government and towards something different. Um, we're still uh, in the process of discovering what that different is. I want to talk briefly through the three major dimensions of that and what they mean for uh, for Myanmar's COVID response. Of course, we know that there is a political dimension here away from that autocratic rule to something closer to democratization. That's, uh, that's an ongoing process and it's one that hasn't been achieved yet. For one, uh, it's left Myanmar at the moment with a de facto power sharing arrangement where parts of the state are under the control of a civilian government, other parts, and uh, these are substantial parts, remain under the control of the military. And what that means in practice is that there is no single authority in the country. There are multiple authorities, and that makes coordination within the government difficult. Any of the kind of, of actions that other countries have taken are not possible because of that. And it also limits the capacity to implement certain types of responses that, uh, that are possible in other countries. And of course, after several decades of repressive rule, there is also a trust deficit in formal institutions, which makes it difficult to implement and to communicate the importance of certain actions to the population. And all of this is happening, of course, as, as uh, Edgar alluded to, against the backdrop of a coming election in 2020, uh, in November 2020, that um, adds a real dimension of political contestation to this, in which uh, both sides are reluctant to give the other, or the multiple sides are reluctant to give the other credit for, for this. And, and there's also a real avoidance of a desire to avoid hardship. And we see, of course, in Canada's neighbor to the south, the United States, how strongly uh, politicizing a pandemic response can affect the efficacy of the policies chosen. Secondly, there is an economic transition away from state planned rule, uh, state uh, uh, rule of, of the economic system to a more open market program. And that, um, after decades of planned economy, has left Myanmar in a very unusual position. Somewhere between a quarter and a third are near or below the poverty line. The majority of those have essentially no savings. Uh, four out of five are in the informal uh, sector of the economy, which means no access to real safety net. And what that means is that there's very little capacity in Myanmar for much of the population to endure protracted economic shock. Right? So there's little buffer space to, uh, to shut down the economy. The relatively weak economic environment has also led to several million migrant workers abroad, uh, many of those have tried to return. Tun Mint is going to talk about the implications of that. But the second implication is that there is a dramatic reduction in the flow of remittances, right, which puts further strains on already limited state resources and the capacity of the state to relieve some of the economic pressures through, uh, through economic uh, programs. Right. And lastly, of course, there's a transition uh, we'd call peace uh, from a state of conflict several decades ongoing primarily in the periphery of the country to, uh, to uh, a state of, of, of absence of that conflict. And that has left that decades long of conflict, the periphery largely underdeveloped. It's left it with limited infrastructure and relatively little uh, penetration of the formal state in some areas. Right? It's also left pockets of the population in extreme precarity. And we see this most pronounced in the IDP camps of which there are many uh, spread throughout Myanmar's periphery, about 500,000 internally displaced persons. Uh, and that's just within the country, of course, uh, beyond the borders of Myanmar, we have other IDP camps, uh, particularly with the Rohingya. There's a pronounced gender dimension to that um, as well. Right? 
So having set the stage, let me now pass the uh, the floor to to Mint to talk in further detail about the public health capacity of the country. Thank you, Kai. And good morning from Vancouver. Good afternoon and good evening. I would like to start with the Myanmar public health capacity. Due to the low interest in investment on health, Myanmar health system has been one of the worst in the world. Myanmar was classified as one of the World Health Organization's crisis country, and it is also one of the highest HIV rates in Asia. The health spending as percent of GDP is also low. However, it has been steadily increased from less than 2% in 2010 to now currently around about 5% as a percent of GDP. However, most of the high tech and also the good resources are unequally distributed in the country. Most of them are concentrated or located in the central plain areas. You can see in the map that 38 of the tertiary hospital, most of them are located in Rangon, Mandalay, or Nipido. In terms of healthcare professional, it is estimated that Myanmar has one daughter per 1,500 population. It is a little bit less than World Health Organization standard of one daughter per 1,000 population. The situation is worse in the rural area that only one daughter per 3,500 population in the rural area. In terms of health crisis and emergency, Myanmar also have a very low capacity for intensive care bed and also ventilator. As of March 2020, it is estimated that there are less than 400 ICU bed in the whole country and less than 300 ventilator. So it's calculated as a only seven ICU bed per million population and only five ventilator per million population. It is very low compared to the neighboring country. And so you can see that there's an urban rural divide in the country. And more than that, there's an instability and conflict in the peripheral area of the country. Myanmar is the country with the longest civil war. We have a civil war since we get independence in 1948. So we have 330 townships in the country and almost one third of the township or more than 100 townships have a more or less conflict in any time. And so the, the output of the conflict is the IDP and IDP camps. That also makes situation worse, especially at the time of crisis. And this area, you know, Myanmar also used to be divided into the white area, black area, and gray area according to their security purposes. So most of the black area and gray area, the government cannot provide health services and at the Angry and NF Health Organization are taking care of health problem in their regions. And also, Kai just mentioned that we have almost half million internally displaced person or IDP, you know, in the country, and they are living in the camp. It's also challenging our healthcare control measure for COVID-19. Because healthcare can you can there's a crowded big bay are suffering malnutrition, shortage of water for hygiene purpose, and also government control the movement inside and outside of the camp. And some of the camp or region in the country, the government blocked the internet for over a year now. So there's a communication is not flowing smoothly in this area. These are the, some of the challenges. In terms of number, Myanmar is a, one of the 
the country they get COVID-19 diagnosed at the late stage. Myanmar got first reported case at the end of March, in, on 23rd of March. And the case, total case is, up to yesterday is 336, and this morning I got, you know, I, I see one more new case, so 337 cases reported. And among them, 160 cases are local transmission and 176 cases are imported cases. So the government is more focused on the prevention of imported cases. Unfortunately, we cannot find the data of how many women and how many men got the disease. But the epidemiology said that COVID-19 is indiscriminated or the gender. And especially it is a little bit more you know, severe impact on me. And also we could not find the data of how many Bengali or also known as uh, Rohingya have a HIV, in, sorry, COVID-19 impact. We only know is that recently a lot of cases have been diagnosed in the refugee camp among Bengalis. And when you see from the map that most of the cases are diagnosed in Rangoon. More than two thirds of the cases are diagnosed in Rangoon and this shows that most of the diagnosis is happening in the area with the good health coverage or testing facilities available. Uh, we have to give the credit to the Ministry of Health and other concerned ministry for their rigorous control activities. Since the epidemic occur, Ministry of Health jumped in and start giving the health education and risk communication to their people. They also encourage hand washing, wearing masks, and social distancing. At the same time, they also do the temperature check and screening in the crowded area, especially international airports. They also restrict the movement of people and also social gathering. And Myanmar has cancer their important days like Enforces Day and Myanmar New Year, Dingen Water Festival, and so on. And some of the high prevalence townships also make their lockdown and curfew. And also they make the rigorous on the screening on the international arrival and mandatory quarantine for two weeks. But studying in the middle of April, they changed their policy from two week quarantine to three week quarantine plus one week homestay for the two day or four week quarantine. They also put their focus on the early case detection, containment and contact tracing and isolation and treatment at their designated hospital. Unfortunately, due to the lack of capacity or low capacity, they cannot do the lot on the testing. And Myanmar is very low in terms of COVID-19 testing compared with the neighboring country. So far, Myanmar had made less than 100,000 tests for the whole country. It is equivalent to 1,700 per million population. It is less than five, you know, Thailand had made five times more than Myanmar testing in terms of per million. And also Singapore is doing like 80 times more than Myanmar. So we are not sure that these 336 cases are real cases or just the IPAS or the real situation. And I we don't see the there's a you know, like a mathematical modeling or like a confined space and do the prevalence testing or something like that. And also we do not see that they are using the zero K indicator, like more cases, more you know, patient attending to hospital or more death and so on. So but for you know compared to other you know neighboring country. Some of the countries in Southeast Asia, like Vietnam, Myanmar, Laos, have a few cases. 
So for this epidemic, Myanmar is forming the comedy to take care of the epidemics. The, and at, by the end of February, Myanmar declared the COVID-19 as a pandemic and is a notifiable disease. And in the middle of March, they found a national central committee of COVID-19 prevention, control, and treatment led by State Councilor Aung San Suu Kyi. She also opened their Facebook account and regularly holding their video conference with their other stakeholder regularly. And by the end of the match, they also found their COVID-19 control and emergency response committee. And with the, using the no one left behind policy, they found their coordinating committee for prevention and control of COVID-19 with an organization by the end of April. So that same that Myanmar is doing what they can with their limited capacity. And as you know, Kai already mentioned that with their, their strange hybrid governments. And also, they are also controlling the border crossing because the data show that most of the cases or over half of the cases are imported cases. So they limit the international arrival and the international airport had closed until end of July so far. And however, the country have accept their own people or migrant people working in the neighboring country. So there's a flux of influx of returnees or the migrant worker to the low and poorest border from Thailand, China, and Malaysia. And some and also they send a relief flight to bring their people in. In terms of law enforcement, they use the international health regulation and emanation action plan for the health security. But for their quarantine and reporting, they use a prevention and control of the communicable disease law made by the state law and order restoration council. But to be enforced, they use a natural disaster management law and rules for the punishment. However, there's a, a lot of critique on the, you know, like disorganization and, co and lack of coordination among these committee. For example, like COVID-19 control and emergency response committee, Ministry of Health and Sport is not even a member of the committee for prevention and control of COVID-19. And there's also a lot of miscommunication between the central level, intermediate and township level. We are also seeing that there's a lot of complaint and complaint about the unequal or unfair punishment because according to the disaster management law, whoever who break their quarantine or social gathering, they can be they can be given the monetary fine or they have to be one month to one year sentence. And we saw there's a over 500 people they have been sentenced for breaking the law, but some of them get only monetary fine and some of them get six months or one year in prison. So there are a lot of critics going on and complaining about the unfair and disorganized responses. Kai? Thank you. Thank you, Tunmin. Uh, let me just provide a couple of brief concluding remarks on this. Of course, we have a sense that the numbers are low, but as uh, Tunmin pointed out, it isn't unclear. It isn't clear whether those reflect actual prevalence of COVID-19 or are more a function of the limited testing. Right. Uh, we also know, though, of course, that COVID-19, a pandemic of this kind, has a lot of implications beyond just the health costs themselves. Uh, for one. Uh, I think it's really fascinating that COVID has been, in some ways, an inadvertent trial in decentralization and federalism, an issue that's been uh, contentious and and uh, on the minds of many interested in, in development in Myanmar, um, largely to avoid working through the military, which retains control of the Ministry of Home and, and a lot of other large-scale institutions. Uh, the NLD has taken, the civilian government has taken the approach of providing relatively general directives and allowing subnational levels at the state and, and at the township level to implement these. Uh, we haven't seen, at least on such a large scale, 
uh, policy approach uh, of this kind before in Myanmar, given how precise and, and top down it was under military rule. Right. So that's a that's a fascinating thing to watch out of this, whether this provides momentum and, and real impetus towards meaningful decentralization and perhaps even uh, a federal situation solution. But beyond that, of course, the economic and social impact of COVID has been immense. Right? We have to remember that this is in many ways Myanmar's first global economic crisis. Right? It was still a very closed off system during the last global financial crisis in 2008. In 97, 98, during the Asian financial crisis, it was a closed off country and as it was in, in, in previous economic crises. This is the first time it's dealt with a global shock in this way and the, uh, the impact has been immense. Uh, many of Myanmar's key sectors, whether it's garments, whether it's tourism, uh, have been really strongly hit. Uh, remittances have decreased, which is an important source of, of uh, foreign funding and natural gas prices have decreased which reduces revenues for the state right? so this is a this is a massive on all fronts economic shock to the system uh, the world bank projected a uh, or has adjusted its uh, its forecasts for gdp growth from 6.8 percent down to now 0 0.05 in a best case scenario to a contraction of minus 2.5 percent and suggests that um, Myanmar won't return to pre-pandemic poverty level levels potentially until 2021-22 in the very earliest. Right? So the, the human cost of this is, is substantial, the disruption is substantial, and we know from looking around the region that economic crises can have major impacts on uh, on democratization. If we take lessons from the 1997 Asian financial crisis, for example, uh, that ended Indonesia's 30 year long uh, military dictatorship under Suharto's new order. It is the seeds, it provided the seeds for Malaysia's reformasi movement that uh, led to the first turnover in the country's history in 2018. Right? So it had a real, uh, it had a real impact on the political environments in both of those countries as, a, as an impetus for democratization. But we also see in Thailand that after uh, briefly opening up the political system, it um, precipitated the stagnation and the backlash that we've seen for much of the last 15 years. So it can have the opposite effect as well, right? And we, we, we already see clear signs that uh, the pandemic is being politicized in the run-up to the November 8 uh, election later on this year. The military sees this as an opportunity and the USDP that's associated with it to revitalize its image, to present the image of, of a competent and, and stable hand. Uh, the NLD is already under a lot of pressure electorally. Uh, the euphoria that, that uh, led to its its stunning uh, success in 2015 isn't there anymore. Uh, ethnic parties are consolidating, uh, so it likely won't have as many votes from ethnic areas. So what this is running at leading up to is a, a really tight contest in November that has uh, all the makings, you know, looking at precedent from other countries around the region, of being pivotal in the democratization process. Okay, I'll end there and we'll pass it on to our commentators. Great, thank you so much for such a well-rounded presentation, uh, Tunmin and um, Kai. Um, we're now moving to the commentary. We are encouraging you to have uh, your questions ready in the chat box. Um, the first commentator, it's uh, Nuwa Nguyen. She is the Senior Policy Advisor at the Center for Economic and Social Development in Yangon, and she is, which is one of the top think tanks in Myanmar. Uh, NOAA works for, with CSD's uh, Executive Director Zou to engage senior policy makers in Myanmar, and she's deeply involved in the COVID work. You saw part of that uh, earlier in the presentation. Um, CSD has been developing over the last few months um, an incredible plan to to support government and civil society in terms of the uh, of the pandemic. Um, she holds a master's degree in economics and statistics from Chiang Mai University and Yangon University of Economics. Uh, Noah, the floor is yours. You have about six to six, five to six minutes. Thank Thanks. you. 
thank, sure, thank you, Eckert. Thank you for the introduction and uh, uh, congratulations to the presenter. Uh, this is the wonderful presentation. Um, I would like to give my comment by three parts. Uh, the first one is uh, preparedness. We should have, uh, to my opinion, we should have been more prepared uh, since President Xi visits outbreak already happened in China and Myanmar was fully aware of the dangers. However, we did not take any actions uh, until, mid, uh, until March uh, 13. Uh, as the paper said and presenter also presented, the committees for the COVID-19 uh, was formed only in mid-March of 2020. Comparatively, Vietnam and Thailand has already taken full swing preparations um, since February. Although the outcomes were not significantly different between Myanmar and Vietnam, uh, we had six deaths, I think, and Vietnam had a zero casualty rate. Uh, the paper also mentioned about the testing capacity, uh, which is the uh, lowest in Southeast Asia uh, or even compared to many other uh, least developed uh, countries. It uh, implies that uh, the infection rate may have been underestimated, uh, but more importantly, it showed a lack of serious mitigation strategy uh, on part of the uh, government. Uh, at this point, uh, uh, Professor Tumian also mentioned we have hu huge risks of importing cases uh, because we have huge uh, migrant worker populations uh, living in Thailand, Malaysia, and the rest of Asia. Uh, they constitute about 10% uh, of the population and they keep uh, returning home uh, due to the economic fallouts uh, in these countries. So despite of all these risks, we did not significantly improve our, uh, our testing capacity, although uh, we now had our own certified laboratories and sufficient, sufficient testing kits donated by the several donors. Uh, that uh, weaknesses in timely preparations and weak Weak testing capacity have huge implications for economic uh, management. Our poor testing capacity made the government uh, timid in reopening the economy, and we still had restrictions against travels and gatherings. Comparatively, Vietnam has fully restored their economic operations um, uh, a month earlier. Uh, in short, our economy was hit badly more from government's restrictions and non-responses responses rather than from health uh, effects. Another aspect that I, will, I want to uh, look is legal and regulatory responses. Um, uh, I, I like to pick up the devastating incidents of factory derivative on April 18th. Uh, after the Dinjang holiday, which the authors have highlighted. Although this incident was seen uh, as a small error on part of the government, uh, the unpublished report done by the uh, Business Association in Myanmar has counted the economic losses of unexpected and sudden factory closure to the businesses was amount uh, to 30 billion jet, 30 billion jets, uh, because it affects almost all factories around the country, including those in the regions where there is no uh, viral infections. Uh, the Social Security Board, uh, the, uh, the government and the, and the uh, Ministry of Labor also had to compensate the workers who were forced to stay home during these factory closures, and it up to 13 billion jets so far. So the total losses incurred to the employees and the workers in the private sector was around 43 billion jets by this uh, 
single misstep. That amount of losses is equivalent to 50 billion jets, which is the amount that the government offer to rescue the um, uh, uh, hotel and tourism industry, uh, garment industries and SMEs out of its emergency fund. Uh, so you can imagine how costly is a policy misstep and how uh, inadequate is the amount of rescue uh, packages. Uh, the, uh, another one is uh, legal and social enforcement. Um, widespread usage, usage of laws, punctuative provisions, and sometimes draconian nature of and equal enforcement from one case to another. Uh, I also saw the picture of the uh, Christian picture. Uh, that's a famous case. Uh, that was the trial against a Christian preacher under the Communicable Diseases Law for organizing a gathering of more than five uh, persons. That charge was made by the Yangon Regional Government uh, and during the trial period, uh, Yangon Chief Minister Wu Pyo Mindain was found on record that he organized a religious gatherings of more than 30 followers and uh, with the officials, which he defended as um, carrying of official duties as a regional uh, as a regional official to kickstart the renovation of the religious sites. Uh, uh, again, uh, Doang San Suu Kyi, through her Facebook, she posted that uh, her embarrassment of the devil standards. However, the preacher uh, continued with continued with his uh, trial until today, and he is likely to be penalized under the law. And the chief minister continued to serve uh, his uh, duties. Uh, lastly, I would like. To to complement my own evaluation of response from economic point of view. We cannot evaluate the responses uh, just from political and regulatory perspectives. Since COVID-19 affects economies uh, more than public health or political conditions of a country. Although one can conclude uh, the effectiveness of uh, containment measures on the pandemic, we should not overlook uh, very negative consequences of economic fallouts uh, from these containment measures. Uh, in case of Myanmar, such uh, measures can be more devastating than other Southeast Asian economies because we did not have a proper risk uh, management plan. For example, uh, in Vietnam, they divided the provinces into category A, B, or C, or as in India, red, orange, and green. They imposed containment measures based on uh, perceived risks of community transmission. So uh, many A-list or green zones were less disturbed by the containment uh, uh, measures. So uh, priorities. Uh, are given more public, given more to public health measures and policy cons considerations, lack uh, proper assessment of economic consequences uh, to the private sectors. So far, uh, there is no proper assessments of regulatory uh, regulatory impact on the businesses, no um, serious dialogue with the business leader. So far, uh, our government provided relief fund of uh, 100 billion jets uh, to the private sector, uh, which is about the 0.1% uh, of GDP. The fund was established in April, and the disbursements were still carried out until today. Uh, more than 90 days have passed, but not all the eligible private businesses receive these, these rescue funds yet. Uh, these are just some examples of shortcomings uh, or economic dimension 
of government responses. Uh, and I hope uh, uh, we have another seminar like this uh, to discuss uh, more on the economic uh, side of the crisis. Uh, thank you and uh, back to you, uh, Edgar. Thank you so much, Nuwa. Perfect, thank you. Um, we are now, um, we're now moving to our second commentator, Aung Hain, who works as a researcher for the world-renowned International Growth Center at their Yangon office. He has recently co-authored a report on COVID responses in Myanmar together with Paul Minoletti and continues to follow avidly the developments up around COVID in Myanmar's policymaking. Aung Hain is a doctoral candidate at public, in public policy at the University of Oxford, and he works on issues related to public administrative reforms and innovations. Aung Hain, the floor is yours. Um, Ega, thank you. Uh, the, the first thing is I would, would like to commend the, uh, the others uh, for, uh, for the contribution to our understanding of the issue in Myanmar. Um, in, in particular, I think this is, the, uh, the, this is a very uh, careful um, analysis of how the COVID-19 unfolded, is unfolding in Myanmar and how the government is uh, trying to respond to it. Uh, so I would like to commend the others for the efforts. Um, and the second part is I want to give, I want to highlight uh, three things that uh, that might merit um, discussions in tandem with the the author's own paper. Um, the, the first one is, is Myanmar really a, a typical case? Um, I, I do take um, the, the author's point that the um, certain structural constraints um, condition the government response to COVID-19. Um, but with that said, um, the, the certain structural conditions, um, whether we're talking about um, the weak uh, institutional capacity of public institutions, uh, weak coordination, or the high prevalence of um, poverty, um, these are not necessarily unique to Myanmar, and they are very much um, common features of a developing country context. So I think it might be good to reconsider whether and when, where and when Myanmar might be a uh, generalizable case to other countries facing a similar situation now or in the future. Um, the second one, the second thing I want, I think I want to highlight is the um, the structural constraints is themselves. Um, the I, I want to highlight two particular structural constraints that the that probably merit uh, also mentioning. The the, the 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 in the paper the other also talk about the uh, the resource constraint, but I want to highlight that the 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 the, even if the government of Myanmar want to impose very strict uh, social distancing measure, um, low revenue base, uh, along with the historically regressive uh, budget allocation, uh, along with low uh, budget execution, means that the uh, the government the is very constrained in terms of um, tackling the economic fall off from strict. Um, social distancing measure. So that's a first, probably like that's a, that's a structural constraint worth mentioning and discussing. Um, another one is the uh, the security uh, implication dimension of uh, the strict social distancing measure. Um, based on our own conversations that we have had with Paul and myself, um, the, the 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 authorities were very concerned about the uh, the security implications of. Uh, imposing strict social distancing measures. And I'm not talking about civil war, I'm talking about the uh, um, social unrest, uh, potential social unrest. And, and I mean, we can argue whether it's, it's you know, the, the security environment in that sense is fragile or it is perceived to be fragile, but there's another um, structural, potentially structural constraint that uh, constrain the, the government of Myanmar's options. Now, the third point I want to think probably what uh, is important and what um, highlighting is the uh, I do agree, agree with the others um, that the um, the the constitutional provision that divide the state between the civilian government and that the military contribute to weak um, coordination um, and coordinated actions by by the by the government. Uh, with that said, um, it's probably also merit highlighting that the uh, the the coordination problems in Myanmar is multifaceted. Um, at various level, uh, involving various actors, there are there are coordination gaps at many different levels and many different involving many different actors. So that that's the the, uh, the three points. So and uh, I, I want to end with a question to the authors. 
um, the in their conclusion, they 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 suggest that the uh, you know, and I think it's, it's interesting suggestion that the this the economic fallout from COVID nineteen might be the first uh, economic crisis that Myanmar faced after it's opened up its economy to the the global economy. Um, I think it's an interesting point, um, and the other. Uh, Suggesting now that the that fallout may have um, potential impact on the political institutional architecture. Um, so, I, I, so my my question is: through which channel? You talk about the electoral channel, but through which other channels do you foresee that potential impact playing out? Uh, if it is only electoral for, uh, channel, like how would the you know how do you see electoral um, impact playing out on the uh, constitution? on the uh, institutional architecture of the uh, Myanmar state. 